So um, I would like to introduce you to today's presenter, Sherry Weppel. Sherry is a Director of Training and E-Learning Development at GP Strategies and has over 16 years of experience designing, developing, and delivering interactive computer-based and web-based learning modules. Her role is to drive innovative ISD techniques into the processes and provide valuable input on the state of learning and best-in-class practices. Sherry recently completed her MS in Learning Sciences and Technology with a focus on gaming for instruction at Lehigh University. She has also earned an MS in Instructional Design and Development from Lehigh University and a BS in Art Education from Cutstown University. So with that, Sherry, I'm going to um, turn the presentation over to you. Thanks so much, Kayla. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Today, we're going to be talking about ROI. So right now, I just kind of want us to get settled in the conversation. Um, whenever I'm talking about ROI, I seem to be in this type of a situation. Uh, it depends on which side of the table you're on as to what your perspective might bring, um, that you might be bringing to the table today. So you might be on the right-hand side in which you're, you know, perhaps the, the stakeholder and you're looking to find out what the ROI is of the train initiative that you're looking to, to go. Um, or you might be on the right left-hand side in which you are the training consultants who are trying to validate the price point or, or the solution that they're trying to put together that it's going to get the proper ROI or whatever the business impacts the customer is looking for. Regardless of which side of the table you're on, um, odds are you may be coming into this conversation a little late in the game. Oftentimes when I'm involved in an ROI conversation, we're at the point in which we're embarking on designing and developing the training solution. Long past has gone the engineering phases, the vendor selection phases, the uh, beginning of the requirements, the, the actual building of whatever it is that we're training the employees on, whether it be a new plant that's being put into place, whether it be a new computer system that is, it needs to be operated on, um, or whether it be a simple matter of a change that's being made inside the organization that needs to be communicated out. So regardless of what degree in which you're, you're training a, a solution for, the ROI conversation typically comes far too late in the game um, to really make that kind of big impact. So what we're going to talk about today is what are you really measuring? Um, but I always like to be solution-minded. So what this is really going to do is it's going to give you um, a list of questions to ask and a list of things to think about long before you may start to think about your training solution. So it's, it's a good, it's going to be a good deck to have in your back pocket um, as you start to invoke, in, embark on a new um, and exciting opportunity to keep these things in mind. So what is ROI? Um, here's a great infographic. We'll be able to actually send this out post, um, post this session, but we can talk about ROI as being improving performance. So whether that means um, increasing revenue, whether that means increasing your, your team's ability to perform. Um, we might talk about uh, overall equipment effectiveness. So if you're in a plant type of an environment, making sure that you're running at your optimal pace that you possibly can, reducing downtime. Or we might be talking about training solutions and how effective, how satisfied, how well that knowledge transfer is occurring. Um, and these are all the details that we want to have to be able to, to validate the money that we're spending on training. Typically, this comes up a lot within a training environment because at that point in time, a lot of the money for the project has already been spent, unfortunately. Um, you know, we've already gone through the phases of the build, we've gone through the implementation, and with whatever is left over, we, we need to be able to figure out how we're going to train individuals on what we've just accomplished. Um, so a lot of times that's where the ROI conversation starts to creep back up because we need to validate the fact that we do still need to spend this money and that it, this is still important. So as training professionals, we have a really challenging situation on our hands of how we um, make sure that we're getting what the, the learners what they need. So as we start to think about ROI, we need to think about INVEST. Um, and I always like to have some sort of an acronym that we can use to remember things by, but we want to invest. And these are the things that we want to invest in. We want to invest in our infrastructure. We want to invest in networking, the voice of the customer, engagement, stability, and training. So these are the things that we want to consider as we're embarking in any kind of a new initiative, again, whether it be a new plant launch, whether it be um, a change management type of or application-based training type of a situation, we want to be able to think about these considerations. 
So from an infrastructure perspective, what planning or engineering was completed up front? As we look at these, these are just some of the questions that you might want to consider, but as you were going through that planning phase, how did you consider what you were looking to do? Did we think about space? Did we think about how people are going to operate? Um, did we think about the networking that, that needs to be done from an infrastructure perspective to make sure that people are going to be successful at their jobs? For example, you could put together a great training solution, but if in the end people find the system difficult to use or the system is slow or you know, you're in a manufacturing environment and things are, are breaking all the time because we didn't um, you know, maybe think through the engineering process per, uh, effectively, then that's going to minimize the, the outcomes you're going to get from your training solution. It doesn't matter how great that training is. If there were actual problems that occurred in the engineering phase or in the design phase or the user requirement phase, you're not going to get that benefit that you want. So this is really highlighting um, choosing the right vendor, um, making sure that you're thinking about training well in advance. These are some of the questions that you need to be considered, that you need to consider long before you may ever start actually developing the training. So it's important for you as training professionals to get involved in the conversation as early as you possibly can. From a networking perspective, how is everyone involved in communicating about the changes being made? So communication becomes key in any kind of a training initiative, any kind of a change that's being invoked inside of an organization. This is going to impact your training solution, too, because if people don't know what's changing, if people don't know how they're impacted, if people have a lot of fear or anxiety related to what's going to be changing or how their jobs might be impacted or their day-to-day -day responsibilities, then they may not be focused on the training that they're receiving, or there may be other things that are getting in the way of them learning that knowledge. Um, so are there regular meetings scheduled so that everybody can talk about who's doing what, what everybody's part's going to involve, how they're going to be successful? Um, is there a decision maker? And that decision maker becomes key. It's going to make sure the decisions are made in a timely fashion so they are able to move forward. And do you have change management involved? You know, oftentimes change management comes into play when there starts to be problems. Um, but we really need to have some element of change management involved from the very beginning of the project. Um, that's going to be critical to make sure that um, everything moves smoothly, everyone is communicated to, everyone knows what's going on all along the way, and it's not two weeks before go live, this training comes out on the LMS, and they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't even know something was happening. So we need to make sure that we're communicating um, and working through all of those dynamics as a part of our end-to-end -end solution. We also want to think about the voice of the customer. So if there's anything that you're doing, um, any change that you're doing, you know, whether it be a systems-based uh, implementation, you're putting in a new a new portal for customers, you know, maybe you're putting in um, new practices that customers might need to get adapted to. We need to think about how the customers are going to react to that as well. Um, if the customers aren't happy, really none of us are going to be happy either. You know, either sales are going to go down and that's going to impact it, or you might be in a customer-facing role in which customers are going to impact your day-to-day -day responsibilities, your day-to-day -day experience. Um, you know, if you have customers calling every five minutes being angry about something that went into place, well, that's not really going to be a good day. Um, you're not going to get the benefit out of the trading initiative that you want. So things to consider is, again, are the customers impacted by the change in any kind of a negative way? If they are, what we need to make sure that we do is go back to that change management that we just talked about. So we need to make sure that we're communicating that change not only internally, but also externally to our customers and resolving as much of their pain as we possibly can. We also need to think about our employees as customers as well, or whoever it is that we're training. So how do they feel about the, train, the change? And their feelings are going to determine how successful it is as well. You know, whether you're able to communicate all of the information, the knowledge transfer that you want, if in the end they don't really like the change or they're not happy with what's going on, you're not, again, going to get the benefit and the, the optimization that you're really looking for. And making sure that you also have a place to capture that feedback and make sure that that feedback gets somewhere that's noticed. Um, you know, all too often we, we put something in place in which there's an email or a helpline in which somebody can 
document feedback or, or give their opinion, but if that doesn't go anywhere and people don't see a difference, um, then really that's going to also impact the, the return on your investment. We also want to think about engagement. So how are we, um, what kind of constraints are we putting in from the training perspective when we think about delivery? So all too often as we think about training, we think about how can we get it out to the most amount of people at a time. We think about how we can reduce travel and expenses. Um, we think about how we can make sure that we're tracking information and we're getting that, that data points, those data points that we need. All too often, those are business drivers that we need to be able to meet. But we also need to think about what are the constraints that we're putting in place and are any of those going to be barriers that are going to pre prevent us from getting that return on investment. So as we think about the engagement piece of it, so is your training plan optimal for learner engagement? Do you have class sizes of 200 um, that you're looking to train people on all at the same time? Well, you're not really going to get that one-on-one -on -one type of an experience. You might be better off doing some sort of an e-learning based solution because they'll get that personal one-on-one -on -one feeling um, while also being able to reach a mass audience. Other things might be um, around how they're accessing the curriculum. So if they have to go through a series of portals or if they have to remember a new password um, that's unlike the passwords that they've had before, if the training runs slow due to server, server issues, if there's any kind of challenge with accessing the information, that's going to kind of put that ding on your return on investment as well. So it comes down to really thinking through what your solution is, how it's going to get to the learner. You know, when you consider a training solution, it's no longer, these are the objectives that I need to be able to hit. Okay, I want to do it as an instructor letter and e-learning training. I have six weeks to get it done, and let's go. We need to start thinking through that communication, that change management, how we're going to deploy it. We need to talk to people and make sure that whatever we're deploying is going to be received well and is going to be helpful to those learners. So while it may make sense in our minds to give them a 100-page manual, if that's not going to get them quickly answers to their questions, then that's not going to be an effective solution. So delivery becomes a really important piece of it as well. From a virtual standpoint, are you using other means of collaboration? So you might not be able to pull everybody together anymore into that, that in-person session, but you can use social media tools. You can use Yammer. You can use Twitter. You can use SharePoint as ways of grouping people together and getting people to communicate back and forth, especially from a global perspective. So are you leveraging all of the different um, tools in your toolbox to be able to maximize what you're what your experience is going to be. We also want to think about stability. So what is the potential success for the employee? And this means more than just how stable is the training solution. This is how stable is the solution overall. So how stable is the system? We've had a lot of training solutions that we've worked on with customers where they're putting in a system, but the system is it's not ready yet, it's going down frequently, um, you know, you're working on making sure that everything is running smoothly, but they're rebooting and they're putting patches in and they're making changes, and all of these changes are made, being made up to go live. Well, that means that your training materials aren't really going to be entirely accurate, um, and they're not going to have a sufficient amount of time to test. So making sure that um, all of your information is decided and everything is locked down in the very beginning to prevent those kinds of changes from being put into place. Um, thinking about the stability of the system and making sure that you test it not only in the area in which you're deploying it, but also any region that might touch it. Um, so particularly from a global environment, oftentimes we'll test things maybe in the U.S. or we'll test things in wherever we're, we're working on the project, wherever that, that Tiger team is. We, we don't always test it in every region in which our learners are going to be affected. So making sure that we can access it in China, making sure that we can access it in Japan, in Russia, um, in South Africa, in South America, making sure that wherever our learners might be, that we've tested it out, it works well for them, they don't have any bandwidth issues, and they'll be able to be successful. Because even if, again, you have this great training solution, everything's put in place, 
if they go to access that system or they go to access um, that environment and they hit a wall and they can't access it, it doesn't matter how great your training solution is, they're going to be angry, they're going to be irritated, and it's not going to bode well for the results that you're going to get. We also need to make sure that we plan for system outages, um, anything that might be unexpected, in letting the learner know about these things in advance so they don't think that the system's broken, um, so they don't think that the system's unstable. And then we also need to make sure that everybody has a comfort level before we hit that button of go live. So there is a, a certain element of a pulse check that we need to be able to do to make sure everybody's comfortable, everybody's confident. Um, because if everybody's trained, the system is stable, everybody's confident and ready to go, you're going to have much more of a return on investment. You're going to get that maximizing that you want. You're going to get that optimization that you want. You're going to see those business results. But again, it wasn't just that training solution that, that drove it. It's also all the other pieces that have gone into play. So there is the training component, so not to dismiss the role that training does play in ROI. Um, but there's also some things to consider from that perspective as well. Uh, we actually have this really big timeline that we look at when we look at uh, capital expenditure projects. And when we, I was looking at it for the first time, I was struck by this little blue bar. Everything's color-coded by what the, the different type of uh, activity it is. And I was struck by the fact that there was this little blue bar that was all the way towards the front of the project at like pre-engineering. Um, and it, it just seemed out of place because the rest of the blue bars were towards the end of the timeline, and that blue bar was about establishing a training budget. And it was exactly where it belonged. Um, so making sure that at the start of the project, as we're in the solution phase, as we're in the engineering phase, as we're in you know, the software, as we're in the vendor selection phase, making sure that we're establishing the training budget, making sure that we're allocating the appropriate amount of funds for translation, for deployment, for sustainability, for um, keeping things up to date and maintenance, making sure that we're establishing that button and budget and then keeping it there and making sure that we don't steal from it when we need it um, so that we have what we need towards the end of the project to get the job done right. We also need to make sure that we have enough time to complete the training, which becomes, you know, some of the hardest problem um, is making sure that we have enough time to get things done, um, making sure that there's enough time for translations, um, and then also making sure that there's enough time to deploy so that we don't get back up against the wall. We have the go live and maybe we have a week or two. You know, we want to have that six weeks um, is the ideal four to six weeks sweet spot to be able to deploy training um, and get that maximum benefit, giving everybody time to take the training, ask questions, issue any kind of remediation, and get everybody comfortable before we go live. So as we look at some key takeaways, there's just a couple of things to consider. So again, considering how your infrastructure is going to affect your outcomes and your overall project success. So making sure that there's no technical requirements that are going to prevent you from being successful. Because again, if you create this really interactive and engaging e-learning module to communicate your message, but from a bandwidth perspective, it just spins and spins and spins and they can't load it. Um, or if as they go into the system, the system spins and spins and spins and they can't load it, then that's really not going to get you that, that ROI. Um, you also need to consider about, as you're changing your process, networking all of your individuals together in, inside your organization. So making sure that everybody is networking and talking and communicating about the change that's going to occur so that everybody's in the know. Uh, we know that if there's changes occurring in one part of the organization, that they're going to work seamlessly together in the end. We want to think about that voice of the customer, including your end customer and your employees, making sure that not only your customers are satisfied, but your employees are satisfied as well, and that everything works well for them. We want to think about your, how your training constraints might impact your engagement, so whether your training sizes are too big, whether your deployment methods aren't working, um, whether you're not translating because you don't have time and that's going to alienate some of your global audience. These are all things to consider. We also want to make sure that we're planning for system changes and system stability, so making sure your system is stable, that everything is going to work smoothly for them, um, and that if there are any outages, that they are well aware of them in advance and it's not perceived as the system being down or the system being broken or ineffective. That can really undermine your change management strategies. And lastly, making sure that we plan ahead for the training needs. 
Um, so making sure the training is engaged all along um, the end-to-end the -end process because they're going to be able to give the input on what needs to be considered from an infrastructure perspective, from a networking, from what the customer and the learner and the employees might want. Um, they're going to make sure that we have the right things in place from an engagement perspective um, and making sure that they can give some nice um, ideas around communication from a stability standpoint for system outages and really making sure that everybody is communicating together so that you get the end results that you're looking for. So at that point in time, we have reached the Q&A section. Um, and if we have any Q&A, can, you can put them into the Q&A module, which as Kayla said at the very beginning, is in the lower right-hand corner of the, the WebEx module. And so we're going to jump into some questions now. But if you have any other questions, please just pop them into the the section and we'll be able to answer those right away. So one of the questions is, is that there was a lot of information presented. Um, what is the one tip that I have for getting the most out of ROI? Um, there is a lot of information that was presented. We will be giving out the deck, the recording, um, and some of these slides have been tweeted and some of the infographics have been sent out. So you'll be able to download those and use those as well. The one big tip really comes down to planning. Um, when it comes to training, oftentimes, again, because we're you know, usually out of budget at that point in time in a project life cycle, uh, we're trying to put something together that we can with what we have left over. Planning becomes key of making sure that you're planning who needs to communicate, um, what needs to be put in place, making sure that all your, your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted to be successful. So all too often, the planning phase from a training perspective comes far too late in the process, which is really what gets us into trouble. Um, it, it, what gets us, it what gets us to not only not have an ROI on our training initiative, but also on the initiative overall. So really making sure the training is first and foremost in the, the product life cycle. We're thinking about that in the very beginning, involving those individuals in your organization to make sure that we're considering everything that we need to from a training perspective. Uh, another question that we have is what has been the biggest stumbling block for ROI? Um, that's a tricky question because I think it's different from, from every organization. I think a lot of the stumbling blocks have been around um, not thinking about maintenance. Uh, so as we develop training programs, we think about the training program that we want to put into place that we think is going to be impactful. Um, but we don't always think about maintenance. So how are we going to maintain this curriculum? Who is going to maintain this curriculum? And what budget have we established for maintaining this curriculum? So one of the things that you can do from that perspective that's very helpful is you have the ability to um, maybe work with your vendor. Um, so whatever vendor you're pulling together, whether it be a software vendor or whether it be um, the engineering firm who's, who's putting your, your plant together, working with them to put together any kind of training documentation. Um, oftentimes, they'll have this kind of commercial off the shelf. Um, they'll be updating it as a normal practice of their business so you can get maintenance contracts where a lot of your step-by-step -step instructions can already be done for you and then, you know, getting some sort of maintenance contract where they can then update the content for you periodically. This becomes really critical from a translation perspective um, because if they're also translating those materials, then that's one less step that you have to worry about. So translation becomes a big sticking point with how you keep your content up to date um, because remember, if you translate it into however many languages you might need, you then, every time you update it, need to translate it again. Um, so translation is really important for learners. Um, it's important that it's in their native language and that they get everything that they need and that they can understand it. And it's definitely something that you have to consider from a maintenance standpoint. One other question uh, that we have is, how can gaming be used to chart ROI? So that's a very interesting question. Um, so gaming can be used as a way of, of eliciting feedback. Um, so you could have games that are out there that are either eliciting satisfaction feedback. Um, you can have games that are out there that are soliciting um, how well they know knowledge. It makes it a little bit easier than just giving them kind of a smile sheet or the score of one, one through four or giving them some sort of an assessment. Um, you know, those formal assessments, while they will give you the details that you're looking for, they're not necessarily going to give you 
the most accurate details of time. You know, people may just go straight down and do straight fives and everything's great, it's fine. You know, I just want this out of my inbox. Um, from an assessment perspective, if they took it really close to the training module, they may just have a really good recall or they may have taken copious notes to be able to answer the questions correctly. Or they may want to make sure that they answer it so that they're successful, they pass, and that's passed on to their manager. Gaming can make it a little bit more fun. So you can have games that are sent out, not necessarily with the training solution, but at like a 30, 60, 90 day mark, um, in which you're eliciting that feedback after the, the go live has already occurred. Um, you're making it fun, you're asking them to recall some of those facts, you're getting some of that satisfaction information out of the learner as well. Um, but you're able to get that data after the fact so that you can see not only this was what I learned at the moment of training, but this is what I remember from 30, 60, 90 days. These are the challenges that I had at 30, 60, 90 days. So that's a, a really great way to tell your ROI of not just what happened in that instance, um, but also kind of where everybody has has taken that knowledge and gone forward with it to, to really make some impacts in the business. Um, the last question that we have is around uh, when do we start planning for training ROI? Uh, now, <laughs> when it comes down to planning for training ROI, you want to start doing that as soon as possible. Um, again, because like I just said, there's certain things that you might be able to get out of your vendor as a part of the package. So if you're working with a vendor who's putting in like a software system, for example, you want to be thinking about training up front because there might be a checkbox that you have to check during the vendor um, selection process that says, I need job aids, or I need tutorials, or I need this, that, or the other thing that you can use as a component of your curriculum. Um, I typically don't recommend that being the whole curriculum because you still want things that pertain to how your business is run, how you're, you're doing it. Um, change management and whatnot, but the nitty-gritty details can often really benefit you because then you don't have to maintain them and they can't manage that maintenance for you. Um, so if you start planning all the way up front and you know what your constraints are going to be, um, you make sure that your training individuals are involved in the process in the very beginning. Uh, you can also make sure that you've budgeted the right amount, um, that you know what your timetable is of when your drop dead date is to start so that you have enough time for adequate reviews, so that you know when you need to, to lock down the system, so that you know when you need to start your translation process. Planning becomes everything, um, and to try and do that as soon as possible. And with that, uh, we are out of time, so I'll turn it back to Kayla. Thanks, Sherry. That was a great presentation and, and great questions, everyone. I know we're a little over with the Q&A, um, but I do want to remind everybody, as uh, Sherry mentioned, that we will be following up with an email, and that will include uh, the slide deck from today, the recording from today, the ROI infographic that uh, Sherry shared earlier, and a blog post where we'll follow up with some of the key takeaways. So I'd like to say thank you again um, to today's speaker, Sherry Wapple, and thanks to everyone who attended for your time and attention. We hope that you'll join us again for our next GP Strategies webinar on measuring human capital, how to strategically invest in your people. This will be on September 16th, so we have a few, um, a few week break there. So uh, for GP Strategies, I'm Kayla Roth, and I wish everyone a great day.